On this week's Vaticano, Pope Francis addresses the public at his first general audience. We get an explanation of the reason for the Lenten and Easter seasons from a Rome-based expert. And these American seminarians speak of how they lived Lent in the Eternal City. Also, we hear about how Pope Francis might renew Catholicism in the New World. This Argentinian priest speaks of his friend, Cardinal Bergoglio, and the ministry of the Catholic order in which the Pope was formed, the Society of Jesus, is explained. This Spanish maestro sings through seven pontificates while the papal portrait artist prepares for another subject coming up. Dio pensa come il samaritano che non passa vicino al malcapitato commiserandolo o guardando dell'altra parte. God thinks like the Good Samaritan, who doesn't pass by the unfortunate, the miserable person, without greeting or by looking in another direction, but rather helps him without asking for anything in exchange, without asking if he is Jewish, pagan, Samaritan, rich, or poor. He doesn't ask anything. He doesn't pose those questions. He goes out to help him. This is how God is. God thinks as the Good Shepherd who offers his life to save the sheep. Holy Week is a time of grace that the Lord gives us to open the doors of our hearts, of our lives, of our parishes. It's a shame to see that so many of our parishes are closed to others. In our parishes, in our movements and associations, we must go out and meet others, to make ourselves close, to carry the light and the joy of our faith. We must always go out and do so with love and with God's tenderness, in respect and patience, knowing that we put our hands, our feet, and our heart to work, but it is God who guides and makes every one of our actions fruitful. I hope that you might all live these days by courageously following the Lord, carrying within you a ray of His love to all the people you meet. Amen. Easter has a long period of preparation, and that period is called Lent. In the beginning of the church, Easter was joined to the main mystery of our salvation, that was baptism. Maybe not the most perfect one, but it's the, the door that opens yeah, the faithful to all the sacraments and to the grace of salvation. That's why baptisms was conferred usually on Easter day. And that's why Lent was a very nice time, even though it was a difficult one. The early church used to fast the 45 days of Quaresma, of Lent, yeah, just to prepare for baptism. So we see, for example, that Saint Augustine, his nicest speeches and nicest homilies are about Lent, because people, yeah, they were not so very, uh, so very happy yeah, to pass a very hard period of preparation to their baptism. So Augustine needed yeah, to entice them and to show them that Lent was a nice period and especially on Easter they would receive the baptism, that is the configuration of Christ, and also it's a, in a certain way baptism is the identification with the risen Christ. Easter is the focal point of the liturgy and of the faith of the church. So it's the, it's the point in, in which it converges everything, also in the liturgical year and the worship in Catholic Church. 
Yeah, we are convinced that the resurrection is the axial point, the our axial uh, structure of our of our faith, because Jesus came to the earth telling us that he came from the Father and he was the Son of God. But there are many religions in which the people say that they come from God. But the only one who has demonstrated was Jesus, who, who rose from the dead. And is the only one by who, with his own power, has defeated the dead. That's why for us, resurrection, resurrection is also the main support of our Catholic faith. In the sixth century, St. Gregory the Great, who was a, a pope and is one of the uh, Western fathers of the church, he remembered how Easter was in the first six centuries, 50 days that are celebrated like one. That's why uh, we said before, yeah, that Easter is the central mystery of our faith. And the church dedicated, dedicates 50 days just to celebrate that mystery of the resurrection of the Lord. So in the 50 days we are continuously remembering that big mystery and how that salvation is given to us. St. Paul, in the letter to the Corinthians, he says, if Christ hasn't, hadn't risen, our faith would be completely empty, useless, without any value. And that's why, for example, that the church, from the very beginning, didn't yeah, have any shame. On the contrary, they dared to announce the cross because behind the cross, or supporting the cross, was the mystery of the resurrection. So when we worship also Christ dying in the cross, that is not a shame. It's not a shameful thing. Why? Because uh, the passion and the cross finishes with the resurrection. So we contemplate also the punishment of Christ, even though it was a shameful thing, as a glory, as a triumph. My name is Kyle Saad. I'm from the Diocese of Harrisburg in Pennsylvania. I'm a third year uh, theologian at the North American College, and I study at the Gregorian in its general theology at the Gregorian University. My name is Alex Kreidler. I'm from St. Joseph, Missouri, and I'm in second theology, first cycle general theology studies at the University of Santa Croce, Holy Cross. These two seminarians have been in charge of organizing the Station Mass Church pilgrimage in Rome this year. Rain or shine, they haven't missed a 7 a.m. Mass for 40 days. The Station Churches began in the late 2nd century, early 3rd century, and it was a way to have the Pope unite the, the, the Church of Rome, and he would lead the citizens of Rome and the faithful of Rome around to different Station Churches, around to different churches throughout the city, to unite them under one culture, under one faith, and then so we still practice that uh, stational church liturgy to this day. Uh, Lent this year has been lived slightly differently. Uh, it is my house job this year to be uh, an assistant to Kyle uh, in the station churches. So I have made that uh, a, real, a real part of the Lenten practice this year. Um, last year I done the station churches and because it was optional, it wasn't really a big deal if I missed a few. But this year, um, I'm required to be there. I'm responsible to help out. And so it's become a practice and a penance in itself. Um, and on top of that, the normal um, kind of prayer, fasting, and abstinence, all with the intention of, of growing closer to our Lord and His passion. Well, hopefully it increases my knowledge of the passion of Christ and what he had gone through, not only through the Passion, but leading up to the Passion as well. And so uh, reading the scriptures and uh, doing devotionals such as Stations of the Cross really helps me understand um, in a small way what Christ has gone through to die for us, for our sins, and for our salvation. It has been a Lent of sacrifice, but also of great rewards. This year, uh, I've sacrificed uh, eating out on um, such as Burger King and other things like that, uh, fast food places uh, this Lent. 
uh, but I also have added things to, uh, to my prayer regiment as well, to the devotional life. And so Stations of the Cross and other uh, devotions as well. This will affect the rest of my year insofar as uh, most of the rest of the semester is in the Easter season. Uh, so with Lent on top of a new semester in studies, uh, it can be kind of difficult. But uh, the fact that Lent is over and we rejoice with the risen Christ might make the rest of this semester uh, a little easier uh, insofar as my house job will be over. Um, we'll be celebrating the resurrection of Christ with him and the whole church. And um, I look forward to going back home for the first time since I've been here for about two years. And I think that um, with that joy, I'll be able to finish the rest of the school year, hopefully on a high note. Francis begins his pontificate between hugs, kisses, and much prayer. He is Argentinian, and being from the Americas, he brings much hope to the new continent. I think it's like 1978 when Cardinal Carol Wojtyla was elected John Paul II, and you saw the real possibility for a renewal of the church in Eastern Europe, Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. 35 years later now, we have a pope coming from Latin America, the Americas. And I think it offers the same kind of a potential for a great renewal of Catholicism and Christianity all throughout the Western Hemisphere. And I'm sure in the United States, uh, so many millions of Hispanic Catholics are looking now to Pope Francis as someone who will really change their lives for the better too. Pope John Paul II really spoke about the fact that we have to overcome the idea of the Americas and look at the Western Hemisphere as, as a single entity with a Christian heritage and a Christian future. Uh, this is a Pope now, Pope Francis, who speaks directly to that, is a product of that. His entire ministry has been that. And so uh, we are going to be strongly united with him in moving this forward. Uh, in December, we were with the Pontifical Commission for Latin America here in Rome, with a, with a multi-day conference on the subject of Ecclesia in America and how to move forward on the 10-year anniversary to bring the message more deeply into the consciousness of Catholics in North America. The Knights of Columbus are active in the U.S., Mexico, and the Caribbean, among other overseas nations. They're taking a cue from the new pope to reinvigorate their work. We need to take our part and cooperate with so many others in the church to build this reality, build the church, like the Lord said to uh, Francis, and I think we're going to see him say the same thing to Pope Francis. And we can't forget that this journey, which Pope Francis talks to us about, is spoken about, uh, is a journey with the Holy Spirit every day. Father Miguel Alderete is a priest from Argentina. He was in St. Peter's Square on March 13th, along with thousands of others, when he heard the name of his friend, Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio. For me, it was a beautiful surprise. It's a great gift from God, and I think Francis will be a great gift from God for the Church. Father Miguel has known Pope Francis for many years from their work together in Buenos Aires. He says that the Pope has always been close to the poor, not only in prayer but in person. He's a pope who is a gaucho, a pope who is going to be close to the people, a pope who is going to take the church to the streets and to everyday people, a pope who is close to the poor. Pope Francis is going to be a pope who speaks with gestures, according to Father Miguel, continuing the legacy of his predecessors. There won't be any changes to the doctrine. On the contrary, his pontificate will be an affirmation of what we know and what we Catholics have to defend. For example, an important issue that Cardinal Bergoglio fought for in Argentina was the issue of life and the family. 
When Father Miguel asked Bergoglio about the conclave of 2005 and the rumors that he was a frontrunner, the cardinal didn't flinch. He told me, look, you know I can't talk about that, so whoever said that is responsible. But the truth is that when I heard his name on the balcony on St. Peter's, I thought there must have been some truth to those rumors, and that the cardinals must have remembered something from that conclave. And now he's our pope. We are uh, 18,000 uh, all over the world and all over the continent. And the activities are the most various. But we can say that there are some typical uh, apostolate which we are doing. First, the spiritual apostolates through the uh, spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius. So we have uh, many, many houses of ret for retreat and for uh, spiritual exercises. Another sector uh, equally important is education. We have uh, all over the world schools at all levels, from the, I would say, elementary school up to the universities. We have a lot of universities, uh, especially in, um, in North America, but uh, uh, even in, other, in, other, in, uh, in Asia. Then there is the pastoral work in the parishes. We have also, we are um, very much involved with the poor. The Jesuit Refugee Service, which was um, founded 25 years ago by Father Arupe, our uh, previous general, that uh, Jesuit Refugee Service is working in the, with the refugees all over the world and uh, is um, completely involved in trying to help those people who have, no, who have to, for one reason or another, they have to abandon their country and uh, very often they don't know where to go. They have nobody who takes care of them and we try to, to take care of them. We as Jesuits, we have a special vow of obedience to the Holy Father. And uh, so if the Holy Father is a Jesuit or not Jesuit, this obedience is the same. Of course, as a Jesuit order, as Jesuits, we, uh, we rejoice of having um, a Pope. We didn't expect that, and we would have not expected that, but uh, now we are happy. There's a saying that goes, he who sings, prays twice. Monsignor Pablo Colino couldn't have said it any better. He's been in Rome singing in the Vatican for more than 50 years. When I arrived in Rome in 1957, Pius XII was here. I've known seven popes. Of all of them, the most musical was Benedict XVI. We've seen Benedict play the piano. I've seen him do so twice personally. Once he was playing a study of Bach, and another time it was a sonata for Mozart. Monsignor Colino witnessed how Emeritus Bishop of Rome Benedict XVI participated actively in the selection of the music for Vatican celebrations. Un día que tenían que cantar un himno de la Virgen el día 1 de enero. One day, they were set to sing a hymn to Our Lady. It was on the 1st of January, when you sing the Vespers hymn. The Latin hymn they had chosen was very monastic and very particular. But the Pope said, no, instead of this one, let's do Ave Maria Stella. That one we all know from the seminary. But the new one, we didn't, so this was a detail I really liked. Music in the liturgy is defined as something essential, most of all for the solemn liturgy. 
most of all so that it may be something truly important in the formation and the spiritual life of the people. So the liturgy is always understood through music. Monsignor Colino will continue to build on his musical legacy now in the Pontificate of Francis. I came to Italy for an exhibit of my work in Trieste. At the same time, I had an offer to work in Rome to do portraits on commission. I thought I would be here for three months, but Rome wouldn't let me leave. I was approached to do an official portrait of John Paul II. And so I began to study his life. I read his encyclicals, the story of his life, which was beautiful and also quite dramatic. That's how I got the idea to paint the Pope a bit hunched over, as if he had the weight of the world on his shoulders leaning on his staff. He's looking toward the future with hope and love. Benedict XVI is an extraordinary person, someone who is very sensitive. And I am very sorry and upset that he had stepped down because it touched my heart but I know he made the right decision, and we must pray for him.